Could you start off by telling us how the protest movement came about and what it is that the protesters wanted? The, the starting point was the death of a previous secretary general of the Communist Party called Hu Yaobang. Hu Yaobang was a reformist, and he had been dismissed two years earlier uh, because uh, of pressure uh, from the hardliners within the party. And the students, when he died of a heart attack, uh, there was a lot of emotion because the students felt that he had been unfairly treated by, by the party and that his memory might be badly treated by uh, the official uh, media and, and party. And, and so they, they gathered um, to express their emotion uh, to the death of this man and ask for his memory to be honored. And, and that was the starting point, but very quickly it, it led to uh, demands of freedom of expression, of end of censorship, uh, and uh, in the end of full democracy. Uh, so it's it's really something that came uh, was started by uh, something totally totally outside the the, the campuses or outside uh, any government decision, but led uh, to this growing movement, which became a huge thing because uh, not only the students occupied uh, Tiananmen Square, which is really the heart. Of of Beijing in front of uh, the People's Assembly, um, but also uh, the population started uh, supporting them and, and, sh and bringing them food, water, uh, expressing uh, support to their rallies and so on. So it, it really became a, a, a crisis and the party leadership felt besieged. And. Um did Chinese officials at the time agree on how to respond to these student protests? No, that's that's actually the problem, is that the, there were very deep divisions within the party. You had really two wings, uh, very contradictory wings. One was the, the moderate one uh, that was in favor of dialogue and of some kind of political reform. It, it was led by the uh, su successor of Hu Yaobang, the new secretary general called uh, Zhao Ziyang, and the hardliners who wanted to be firm and, and who didn't want to give in on any of the students' demands, led by the prime minister, Li Peng. And, and these two uh, factions argued uh, for some time, and they went to see uh, Deng Xiaoping. Deng Xiaoping was the uh, successor of Mao at the uh, head of China. He was very old, but he was the, the referee, uh, the arbiter of, of uh, uh, disagreements within the leadership. And he chose the, the hardliners. Uh, he felt that there was a danger in this movement of losing the grip of the party on power and on the society. And so um, the whole months of uh, April and May leading to the massacre on, on June 4th uh, was really uh, uh, the, the fight between those two factions and how to respond to this uh, increasing challenge. And in the middle of, the, of this, you had the visit of Mikhail Gorbachev. Gorbachev was the leader of the Soviet Union at that time. He had started uh, political reforms, and Zhao Ziyang saw himself as a kind of uh, Chinese Gorbachev. Uh, and, and he was under attack for that uh, from the hardliners. And, uh, and one day, Deng Xiaoping called him and said, uh, I want the square, uh, Tiananmen Square, to be uh, empty when Gorbachev arrives, otherwise we lose face. Uh, uh, the image of China will be terrible in, in front of the world. And Zhao Ziyang tried to plead with the students to evacuate, and, they, and he failed. And that was the end of, of his reign, and he was dismissed, and, and, and the conflict became inevitable. How many people were killed? Because it's, it's not mm. clear. It's, a, uh, it's still under debate. There's no way uh, we know for sure. There is a, a bottom figure of 303. Uh, dead, uh, which has been established by the mothers of Tiananmen, the, the mothers of some of the victims have organized into some kind of association, and they have collected some names, uh, but many people refuse to, to join because they were either under pressure or scared. So, but 303 is the confirmed uh, minimum figure. The, the higher figure is the one that was established at that time by the Red Cross, which was uh, 2,700. Uh, killed. So between 300 and 2,700, it's a big margin, uh, but we don't know for sure. What's left of pro-democracy efforts in China? Where do they stand these days, would you say? They, they've hit a, a wall, uh, to be honest, uh, because uh, after Tiananmen, there was another attempt to not so much to, to uh, challenge the power of the party, but to create a civil society 
next to the party. And, and uh, Liu Xiaobo was one of the promoters of that approach. Uh, and in, in the early 2000s, there was uh, a lot of uh, movement in the society, uh, lawyers, uh, environment, uh, um, uh, AIDS, uh, fight to, to fight AIDS, they were, they, to fight injustice in the, in the appropriation of land. There, there was a lot of um, society action. And and that was allowed for some time by uh, the, the, the Communist Party. And at one stage in 2008, there was a, a clampdown. Uh, Liu Xiaobo was arrested because he organized uh, the Charter uh, 08, which is uh, a kind of manifesto for democracy in China. And that manifesto was signed by hundreds of uh, intellectuals, um, university academics, um, doctors, uh, and so on. And, and the government got scared, because all of a sudden there was a kind of opposition network that was uh, emerging. And so Liu Xiaobo was arrested. Um, he was sentenced to 11 years in prison, and he died before the end of his term. He, he won the Nobel Prize, the Nobel Peace Prize in 2010 uh, for uh, this uh, action. Uh, but all um, resistance from the society was uh, really broken, I, especially after Xi Jinping arrived in power after 2012. Uh, in 2015, uh, 250 lawyers were, were arrested, and they were only released if they signed a, a commitment not to touch sensitive issues. So. Uh, it has become uh, the, the room for maneuver for, for this kind of action um, is extremely limited today. It's hard to imagine anything like it happening these days. Not only that, but the society has changed also, because the, the, the deal that Deng Xiaoping tried to push after uh, the massacre uh, to, to relaunch his political reform, his uh, economic reforms movement was to, to, as he said, get rich, he told the society, get rich. And, and so hundreds of millions of people came out of poverty uh, during those 30 years. And today, you have a middle class urban middle class that has something to lose. And I think people will, will make a, a, a kind of calculation in their mind. Uh, uh, I know what I have, which is an improvement of my life compared to the one of my parents or my grandparents. Uh, and that and explains I, perhaps why the Communist Party is endured in China and, and not in other countries. Yes, exactly, because they, they have managed to, to strike this balance between uh, a strictly authoritarian regime and economic success. And that is unprecedented in history. And that's why China is a, is a challenge of, of uh, uh, incredible proportions, because uh, this was not expected by political science or by uh, any commentators uh, in the past 30 years. All right. Well, Pierre Husky, thank you very much thank indeed you. for coming in to talk to us today on thank the 30th you. anniversary of the Tiananmen Square massacre. Thank you.